Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and today we are heading to the province of Saskatchewan, particularly the southern part of Saskatchewan, to sit down with two-term mayor, His Worship, yes, I'm going to call him that the first time, His Worship, Mayor Marcel Roy. Mayor Roy, welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Thank you. Happy to be here. So, Mayor, I want to start with the very first question I've asked every single politician who's ever come on this show, and it's a little bit different because of your background. As someone who has been in the armed forces, who worked as a police officer, and now as mayor of the city of Weyburn, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? I guess it came from uh, the community within. Uh, I did a lot of, I do, and I still do, oil field safety training. And with that, I was where a municipal election was coming up. There was kind of a movement for a whole shift within the whole province of uh, different uh, looking for new people. And I was asking other people, and they go, no, you've done lots of within the community. You're known. You need to. We'll back you. And that's kind of where it came from. I was always, through my youth and growing up, I was always kind of a political, a bit of a political cat and listening to things. Uh, but I never really actually entered into the fray as this. So had you had you thought about politics, about entering into politics prior to that 2016 election? Or was it something that you'd be okay with being the volunteer, helping out on campaigns, putting up signs, and never no, wanting to? More, it was, yeah, it was more of that, that I was happy to, to work in. And then when it came down to it and asking and trying to find people to go front and center, uh, there was it becomes this difficulty. And I think that's where it becomes difficult for so many uh, municipalities, even in places like Calgary, trying to find uh, municipal candidates to people that want to come forward and do that time-consuming work that is required for working within these realms. The, the pay, uh, in comparison to industrial pay uh, out in the industry, is not high-paying, although the taxpayers may think <laughs> it is high-paying, but it's not for the number of hours that you're putting in. And that's where a lot of the people, it just simply doesn't draw. And that I think that was even voiced way back in the time of the conception of the United States. They said, we're, we're going to have democracy will not work because the, of the low pay and the people that you're going to be able to draw into these uh, realms. So was it an easy yes for yourself? Because after looking for other people, you you must have went back and forth and said, okay, is it Marcel's time to put his name on the ballot? Is it, am I the best candidate? Because you could have still looked, but at the end of the day, at one moment you said, okay, it's me, I'm going to do it. And I believe X is why I'd be the best candidate to help advance the city of Weyburn forward. I think you kind of go through all the checklists and, and look at it. And I don't know if I was the best candidate there. I don't know. I still don't know whether it is I am the best candidate. And that's <laughs> what I'm going to watch in a campaign on that. But the, but the truth of the matter is there's a, a lot of people that I know how to surround myself with people that are way smarter than myself. And that is one of the things that I will say. I feel that I don't have that ego that you want to be the one in the room coming up with all the ideas. I'd rather be like your uh, Elon Musk who looks around and goes, I'm going to surround myself with the, the way smarter people. Because there's a lot of young people here that are way smarter than myself. They can feed me ideas. I'll just be the spokesman and, and push it out in front of people. I want, to talk, I want to talk about election day in 26, 2018. 2018 or 2016? 2018, 2016. Right? 2016. 2016. I I'm looking after two pieces of paper, 2016. So on election day in 2016, we always remember the very first time you get to go into the ballot box and vote for yourself. I remember when I was a municipal councillor uh, candidate back in Ontario, when I moved out here, I ran again. And I still remember that feeling as well. For you, what was that feeling like going into that ballot box and putting that X beside your name? Because you, at least at the end of the day, you know, you've got one vote. <laughs> That's right. I've got one vote. I would hope that my family, the family is going to have, going to have some more votes, and they're going, well, you know, it is a secret ballot, and going, oh, well, thank you, sons. <laughs> and they're going, you, you feel, and you know, then you look and you see your name there, and then I think when you got elected, they're going, you know, you are the mayor now. 
I'm the mayor. And it's just like this little kids, you know, you say, well, he's the mayor. And they're going, mayor, what does that mean? <laughs> That's a mayor. <laughs> and you, you realize, but as you move forward into the job and the position, you realize and understand what the mayor's position really is in Canada. And I say this about all of Canada. We've got a, I think Canadians have vast uh, misconception of what mayors are like as compared to the United States mayors. We don't have that presidential veto. On that. We are just one vote and we hopefully are able to move the rest of council towards the way we want to see it and we can boast it. But as you've seen in some of the different cities and the major cities across the northern Regina and Calgary, uh, some of the councils just went, no, we're not following the mayor this time. And they've changed things completely and, and they've gone to different votes. So and we don't have that. So it's um, you have to really come into the idea of a great understanding of governance. And I think that's what makes uh, a good mayor, that's what makes a good council, is their understanding of what governance act actually means as compared to you can't get out there and do operational uh, stuff in there. Stay out of operations, that's what administration, that's what your people are there for. We're gonna give the grand overview, the governance overview of what we have to do. And this council, we've done a lot of training on that subject, we've taken classes upon classes. We're probably, uh, and I don't want to sound egotistical on this one, but we've probably ramped up our training of governance far more than a lot of councils before us that understood, uh, because there's a lot, that many more uh, courses out there offered on what governance is all about. I want to bring uh, back to a statement that you made earlier in the interview, and you said you'd like to surround yourself with the smartest people in the room. As a council, I'm assuming your council is smart. I'm assuming in 2016 when they were elected, they were smart people as well. You are one vote, though. You have to sway people to your way of thinking or get swayed to other ways of thinking. Was that a big learning curve for yourself? Because I can imagine going into the role as a former police officer, former person in the Army, an EMT, uh, someone who works in the oil industry, I can imagine it is a unique experience to go into that leadership role and not be seen as the leader, but more as someone who is going to guide the council in a forward direction while trying to bring everyone else along and persuading them into your way of thinking or into the way you want the city to uh, be viewed as. Uh, you're absolutely correct. And I was very fortunate in past council and in this council that we've got uh, a lot of people who, although they're all their unique individuals and they still have their own unique ideas, there is this vast 70 percent, let's say, of movement towards there. We don't have uh, a lot of people where we've heard in uh, other municipalities that they've got a, a, a just a terrific uh, off to the side, a split, totally split council where it is just nothing but opposition all the way through and the councils are there. One of the questions that you talk about at the end that you had said, where do you go to decompress? There's not, uh, presently, there's not a lot of decompressing uh, going on because our council is not that we're uh, all together because we each has to be their own individual, but we've also, uh, through our strategic planning and through talks of how we wanted to see the city, we've kind of come to an understanding of where we are. So now when council does business, it's more like business approving the tenders that we already are put forward and already have that answer on. So it, as, I guess that's a roundabout way of saying that our council has been very good trying to move them along. There's things that are tweaking. And a lot of times I had to just, I vote and I'm outvoted and that's the way it is. And uh, there's been a few things that I've been outvoted on, but. So be it. That's how it goes. How how important is it to not hold grudges, particularly on this local level that we call local politics? Because party politics, partisan politics in Regina or in Ottawa, you're going to get that partisan politics where you go in, your side's going to win if you're in the majority or you're not going to win if you're in the minority. How important is it not to hold grudges, like you said, where you said, I've been outvoted sometimes and I've just had to walk away and say, OK, I've been outvoted. And I think it's very important. I think that's what people have to understand and somehow learn how to do is not hold the grudges 
about tennis. You just say, so long as everything has been done all above board, and everything's above board, then you, well, what are we going to do? You got uh, your, it hasn't been anything like a, <clears throat> a shady vote or whatever you want to call it there to get things through. It has just been simply, uh, we've moved forward with it. And what advice would you give a new uh, mayor? Because in uh, BC, Ontario, Manitoba, they just went through municipal elections. There was a big change over there. What advice would you give uh, mayors who are in this job for the first time, coming from someone who's been there for almost seven years? Learn to uh, learn to understand, I guess, your council. Get a really good talk to your administrator to understand where the develop a strategic plan. Uh, that's where I'm going with it. And that's what our administrator has been able to do and has worked with us. Get a strategic plan right away with your council. You really only have four years to get, you don't really have four years to get things done. Uh, the, the, as you know yourself, that first year is learning and getting everybody in organized. And then the second year and get your strategic plan done right away. You don't, and that's, I guess, is the advice I'd give to the mayors. Don't waste time because you don't have much time to do. First year, you get your strategic plan done. Second year, you're implementing it. And third year, you're implementing it. You're kind of third year, you're wrapping up stuff. And then fourth year, you're into your election. And it's like you're fit. So don't waste time on a lot of frivolous things. Look at what the major points are, what the major objectives are. And also, I'll take a, a statement out of our, our our, our premier who said during the COVID times, because there was a couple of cities walking the boardwalk, he go, his statement was, know your lane, know your lanes, know what you are about. In Saskatchewan here, healthcare is not a city, is not a city. Like, so don't come in and start pounding a fist about healthcare in the city council, because that is a provincial and we have nothing. There's nothing we can do about that type of stuff. And okay, but I, I'm going to challenge you on that statement there for a second right. here. Yeah, hopefully you're okay with that, Marcel. Right. Um, Go ahead. Your residents don't care that about that, though. They don't care what lane it is. If they come talk to you about health care, they want you to fix it. They want better access to health care. How do you, as mayor, tell the constituents, your, your people that are voting for you, the people in your community say, I'd love to help you, but this is a provincial issue. Will they not just look at you and say, I didn't go to the provincial representative because I can't get in contact with them. I've come to you to help solve this issue because you are elected to do that. And, and what I'll tell them is just as so many things, I'll push it up to the people. I know the people. And that's what, uh, that's another thing that I would say to the, the mayors, get to know who, get to know your political people, get to know who you can get things done with. And that's where, who you can push the, the problem up with. Right now we have a lot of, social services issues uh, such as your you know your uh, we don't have any street people here but you've got your the homeless and your but we do have a problem with the drugs and and uh, overdoses and such and this is where we say we don't have a social service pro uh, department here that's a provincial one but we will know who the people we talk to and where we can talk and form committees and push this up to the government and make sure that they are well aware of what we're doing but Directly, when I say it's in oil lanes, meaning that there are things that I can fix directly and there's things that I can't, that I have to push up to other things. Streets, roads, water. Yes, we. you can complain to me, I'll push it over to our, and even as mayor, I push it over to our administration and they go to the departments that need to do it. And, and just, the, it's knowing who to pick up the phone and call. That's what it, what it's about. And so which department. One last area I want to talk about before we turn to the second segment two, and that's the city of Weyburn itself. I want to talk about the idea that you are a quote unquote part-time mayor. You get paid as a part-time mayor, you go to meetings, but you, you're not supposed to be mayor 24 seven. But if you go to your grocery store tomorrow, I'm assuming people will know who you are. They will know, Oh, there's mayor Roy. I'm going to have an issue. I want to go talk to him. Have you found that balance between being Marcel and being Mayor Roy? And is there days when you just say, I don't want to be mayor today. I want to go out, grab my post, my mail, and come home and just relax and not have to spend a 45-minute conversation talking about streets or water or roadways? Or 
are you just constantly on? Because you seem like you have the betterment of the community in mind. You have the betterment of the community at heart. But I can imagine the job, a full-time job, gets to you from time to time when you're always on. And, and I am always on. And when I go back home, uh, I don't have the phone ringing to me. Very seldom people phone me at home. And so that, that's very nice. That we did. But going out to the grocery store, <laughs> my stepson did it the first few times. He goes, I'm not going to start with you. This is just too long. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've got no time for this. <laughs> I got to get stuff, stuff done. I'm going. Okay, I understand that, and it takes me longer to go there because they ask people to talk about different things. And but at home, it's it's very good that after hours people aren't calling. They're not very seldom. I have people call, and they know my number. They, you know my home phone number. <laughs> you gave it to me. Just, I was just a random guy who sent you an email, and you gave it to me for God's sakes, man. <laughs> I don't. Have, I don't have a problem with it. I run a business. My number's out there, and everybody knows my number. I'm very, and I now have to say, I'm fairly well known in in the city, mind you. The other, I was kind of hurt the other day. I went to get a haircut, and the one little girl goes, "So, what is your name?" <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I turned to the, old, uh, the, the 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 senior hairdresser and going really, and she goes, "I know she's really shy," <laughs> but I but at the same time, your uh, people know the the call. But I are yeah, they I respectful of your time? Oh, there if you, you say yeah, people, not right now, here's my business card. Call me tomorrow. I'm happy to chat with you. Are they okay with that? Oh, they're okay with that. And they're they're very good. And they they respect my time. And they understand my. What I do in the community and how I, uh, the, the work that I do uh, outside of being mayor. And as you said, you, they're, you're 24, you're a part time mayor. The size of the city doesn't dictate a full time mayor. But also, things have also changed because even like our city hall staff talks that they can do the work. You're not, because of email, Texas, and everything, you do not see people coming into the city hall like they used to in the days gone by. Everything is done, but we've got a new technology. We've got new ways of doing business, and that's where we're very forward. And I'm, I'm very, I'm very, even though I'm older, I'm very into this seeing that the changes that are going on, like things are changing, the world is changing. Uh, I, I watch, um, I'm going to do a bit of a way far off political thing, but globalization is coming to an end because of the way that the world is happening. You know, the, the ship, the state's council is sure the shipping, the, the lower population, lower consumers, everything's happening. So we have to be changing all the time. And one of the ways that we can get around that is our technology, embrace the technology that we have. And because of that, we don't see people coming into the city hall all the time. And the, the contact the, with there is all electronically. More well, so with without that. technology, we wouldn't be sitting down for this conversation, right? It's the uh, way right. the world then, is. That's right. And I think this is a wonderful technology to be able to do an interview like this on, like, why do I have to go into a TV studio anymore? I did a TV, uh, uh, a TV interview the other day, and she says, well, we could just do it by Zoom. Well, I'll do it that way. I don't have to do it. We're having a marriage meeting tomorrow, and it's all by Zoom. And it's just, why do we have to travel? We've got this great technology. Let's work with it. But at the same time, and I'm going to say this, I, I enjoy that personal touch from time to time as well. Don't get me wrong. I love sitting in my basement and doing these interviews with people. But sometimes you do miss that human connection where you're able to sit down and have a coffee face to face because there's something about that that doesn't that you do strive for. At least I do. Well, I know. And it's just like uh, when, I'm in, when I'm in Calgary. Uh, <clears throat> the summer for the stampede, we'll have to sit down and have an old fashioned together. Well, I'm I'm up in Suma. I'm up in Suma this year, so oh, if okay. you're well, at well, Suma, well, we will well, grab that. Yeah, we'll do that. It's like, I just got into these old fashions lately, and so yes, we'll have an old fashioned. Sit there, and that's you're exactly right. You still have to have that human touch, the human, uh, or not so much a touch on their meaning, but that human connection where you're face to face with a person, and you in you're in a room of people, and you're talking. It's uh. We don't have that. I remember the one woman was talking about how in the days gone by, she really missed it. She was a reporter. And she said she was down in Halifax. <clears throat> one lady was talking to her in the 70s. She said, I remember 3 o'clock all the time. We'd, we'd walk in and all the editors would walk in and the head editor was there. And then all of a sudden, two 26s would, 40 ounces would come out and everybody was smoking and they were drinking. And they got the whole newspaper set up. And she says, those are great times <laughs> because we got work done. And then we everybody went away at four o'clock and it was all done. And 
And then we, the next day it was the same thing. She said, but I couldn't take that for it. After five years, I had enough of that. <laughs> After five years, your liver would have enough. <laughs> That's all right. If the liver in your lungs, you'd have enough. We just said, but those are the way, but things got done. And now it's, it's, it's different. Life is different. I, I, yeah. I want to, no. Yeah. So now I want to turn to segment two. And before I talk about segment two, I want to preface this statement by this question by saying this. For those who are listening to this, this is a conversation between the mayor and I. This is not a direction at council. This is not a motion at council. This is his opinion. We seem to always get a lot of email when I ask this question. Uh, Mayor Roy, what, in your opinion, is the biggest issue facing the city of Weyburn today? Uh, It is what we talk about in so many things is simply infrastructure. Infrastructure is the, the main one I can see. We, we've talked about water ever since we came here. We're very fortunate this year. We've got lots of snow. Nickel Lake fills up. But we have, uh, Nickel Lake was designed for a city of, I think, about 10,000 population. We're at 11,000 now. But that's 10,000 when it was, but it's also slumped in a bit with all the sediment and it's smaller. Uh, so water is, is the main one. And we're looking towards how we're going to solve this issue. And there's lots of different ideas uh, going around. So it's like for so many other cities, is infrastructure. The next one is uh, people talk about sustainability. I think the sustainability means are you going to have a city here still working and doing? As you know, there's some other cities, they were retirement communities. And as that population ages and dies off, which is inevitability of life and realism of life, the city all of a sudden shrinks and almost just, just about disappears. Here, we still have to make sure we've got industries that are continuing on. Uh, I'd like to see more manufacturing here, but mind you, you talk to some of the people that come out of the Ontario, and I guess you came out of Ontario and you saw where some of these manufacturing cities may not be the best of things because they're on again, off again, depending on what the mood. And all of a sudden, the car industry decides that they're going away from this type of thing, and the other parts stop and everything drops, and the whole town is devastated. It just becomes different. So, but we've got sustainability here. We've got oil. We've got the agriculture. Very sustainable products around our area. Agriculture to me is super important, but at the same time, it's not. Doesn't have that vibrance that um, it's not big corporate farms. It's not like we've got twenty families out in this one township here. Township we've got all these things. They're, they're shrinking down. And the number of workers on the farms are getting less because of automation. It was just like the oil field was getting less because of automation. You, you've talked about two things I want to touch on here quickly. And one is the aging infrastructure sure. issue that the city of Weyburn's facing right now. You're not the only city mayor or mayor or Reeve or councillor who has said the aging infrastructure issue is a big concern to them right now. How do we fix it? How does the city of Weyburn look at the aging infrastructure and go through a budget process when people are struggling right now? Because you can't put the aging infrastructure fix on the back of people, but you also have to remember that if you don't, the issues are going to get worse years to come. You're drawing me into a political statement that I will say, and I will say this is not the voice of Congress. Uh, yeah. My that... take on is number one. The first off, the truth of the matter is, three thousand dollar tax, probably sixteen hundred dollars of that is is uh, school tax. So we're only getting fourteen hundred dollars out of it, and that's what people don't realize. They think that that three thousand dollars all goes to the city. It doesn't. So out of that fourteen hundred dollars, we've got to pay uh, a vast majority goes to police, fire, and snow removal. And as everybody in Western Canada knows here, snow removal really hit the city big time at the beginning of the year and crushed that. Policing costs more, well, uh, firefighting costs more. Those things are going up. But then we, then the rest is left for our water and our sewer and our infrastructure and paving. The unfortunate thing, uh, some of the newscasters, as we see what's happening in Ukraine, countries are now changing things from, uh, what is the statement, from, from beans to bullets. The uh, Canada still hasn't moved that direction, but you look at Poland, they say that they've gone from 2% to 5% now of their GDP for building up a military. But when you start cutting money out from that, 
interest infrastructure is not going to be happening. They're putting their money elsewhere. Yeah. And that becomes a problem that we rely on the government. It used to be, when I came in, I read a found a book that said 1980, the province used to pay 80% of our bills. Now the province only pays 60% of our bills. And we have to do it more. How do we how do we do this aging infrastructure? We need the help from the bigger governments. But the bigger governments are looking at other issues that they're they're talking about you know and so i I, i'm gonna i'm gonna ask the political question a little bit more here i'm gonna poke you a little bit here if you don't mind me here and i'm gonna open pandora's box (laughs) um you talked about policing uh correct me if i'm wrong but the city of weyburn's under rcmp they have an rcmp detachment right they don't have a city police no we have a city police i have a city police here Okay. Oh, okay. So, so you have a city police. So you don't have that RCMP bill that's going to be coming up here soon. The one that. No, we don't. Uh, have, okay. No, and we don't have, and it it becomes, and we've got a very good working relationship with Estevan Police Force. So we kind of use and, and work with Estevan down the road a lot. They've got their own city police force. And so, yeah, they're not having all the issues that. Are coming with the RCMP's uh, bill and also the RCMP's uh, uh, structure and their and, and what issues they have of recruitment and all that. So we don't have those issues. We are uh, we've got, but at the same time, our police force is being expected to enforce laws that are federal laws, and we're not really we're getting some money, but we're not getting as much as what I would feel that we should be getting. Over the uh, the province is doing well by the cities that have their own police force. I can't imagine the Brown Oaks House doing Calgary. I mean, they're paying a huge amount for for stuff, and, and the provinces should be paying a lot more for the cities, police and you, the firefighters. You talked about sustainability as well, and that being a somewhat of an issue. How do you keep people in your community, but also not put the bill on the backs <clears throat> of them? How have you found that balance of keeping the growth happening in the city of Weyburn, but also keeping that community feel that people have come to know and expect in the uh, the city of Weyburn, because I can imagine, and there's a lot of nimbyism out there in this world, that people don't want to see a massive growth, but they also want better services. They want more uh, police uh, policemen on the, on the streets. They want more fire to, uh, men. So how do you balance that growth while trying to keep it sustainable for the future to come? One of the things that was told to me, so this is not an original thought of mine, but one was told that the Western provinces are very industry-driven uh, economies in that the, the governments of these provinces don't direct the economy, the industry does. We've got, you know, look at the, the huge Richardson family, the, the other ones, they're, they're all private families that have got huge farms, huge industries, and they're driving, and they're moving forward. How do we attract them to our city? They will come if they see an opportunity to make money. And that's what we see in our oil companies. Our oil companies are here, they're smaller ones, big, larger ones are selling out, smaller ones are buying, they're making the money. They're keeping uh, things going. And so what we as a city have to do is just provide the services, good services, and make sure we've got something. And one of the things that we did was we built this uh, indoor soccer field, recreational area, walking track. Uh, the government, the Saskatchewan government uh, attached. We built it together in kind of conjunction. The government built this brand new school. So these are wonderful uh, things that are, becoming in our city that show that we've got vibrance. We are, we're getting a brand new hospital this year. That shows a vibrance to the down to our city. And we are, so these are things that we do as a city that we make sure that uh, to make it attractive to the industries that we're able to work with them, able to give their the employees of those industries lots of good opportunities for their families and a very safe community. The one person said, uh, told uh, another secondhand information, but they said we've never had such a what if we safe feeling in a city as is in Weyburn. He said, you just he said I've been around a lot of places. This is wonderful. You can just walk any hour at night, not a problem. We just we it's a great city. I feel safe with our kids and families. It's wonderful. So that's what we've been able to develop through the years. 
So now if I go to the city of Weyburn tomorrow and I go talk to a hundred people in your city and I ask them what their biggest issue in their city is, they may say infrastructure, they may say sustainability, but they're going to have micro issues as well. They're going to have that pothole that's in front of their house. They're going to have that park that they feel that needs an upgrade. They're going to have that street or that sidewalk that needs repair. While we all while we all know that cities and municipalities are facing a very hard budget cycle this year, how do you, as mayor and as council, look at the issues that your community is facing, the micro issues, the independent issues, and pick who's going to be the winners and who's or who are going to be the losers at the end of the day? Because you can't fix everything in one budget cycle, and some things are going to have to be put off for next year. How do you do that? We, uh, our administration sets priorities, I guess. They look at it there. The, they've got their manager, our administrators that are his managers that look and they set their priorities. We've also developed, administration has also developed a very good cycle, which uh, I don't think was in the past on uh, there. We didn't, wasn't done before. We've got a cycle. So if we've basically, five different zones set up for garbage pickup. We follow those zones where we've started tree cutting. The, the last year, last year, two years ago, we uh, brought in one uh, company. It took a picture of every city tree in the, oh, what a boring job. Every city tree in the city, they cataloged it all. On the, I couldn't imagine that job. They cataloged every tree. So now our tree, our parks and people can look at each city tree and see where whether it's growing or dying or what it's doing. But and then they're going through uh, every area, and instead of just hitting the hot spots, they're going through every area and doing proper pruning all the time. So it's just, it's the structure thing. Yes, we're still going to pick a couple hot spots, but we're still just we're doing. And so that's how we get. One of the things that we've changed also is how we do repaving. We can't do the repaving as as much as what we would like to because it's lack of money. But now instead of doing this where we have to, we add the money onto the uh, people's taxes. We're just simply going out and fixing the streets because that way, because in the past people could petition it out and not want the streets fixed and then we have problems. So we also moved forward. We got our own pothole fixing machine, better technology. This thing keeps the, the things hot. Saw what Regina's uh, was like and they came out. Personally, getting this political, I would have liked to see that automatic one that was a really high end a few hundred thousand the, the more. wants and the needs of a city are always a unique entity are they not <laughs> they are but we've got a pothole machine we're getting a crack ceiling machine so we can do all the stuff ourselves so with a matter of a couple of years i'm really hoping that we're going to see different uh example too some of the really big intersections that heavy trucks use a lot and they push up and as you know in calgary we're changing those over cement we're going to start doing cement instead. So that that is fair. So we're looking at, instead of spending, you know, a little bit of money here trying to fix the hole, we're going to do a long-term, and we're looking longer-term. So that is where we've kind of overcome some of our things that we're doing. Do here. residents, we talked about how residents respect your time. Do residents care about that stuff, though? Because they will believe their issue is the biggest issue in the world. They believe that pothole needs to be fixed. And if you say no to them, it's not as bad as pothole X and your pothole Y. Do they care or are they OK with the idea that if you communicate to them effectively and communicate to them the truth that we need to get this one done before yours because it's in a lot worse shape? Yes, I think they, they do. And we do try to look and then we sometimes we will we'll overlook ones that are really bad and we'll say yes those are we've got the strategy but also there is room to move and maneuver but we don't want to do things like can i say the city's name there is i was out of winnipeg that the the person said they've 10 years 10 years in front of his house he's been complaining and finally they finally came out and fixed oh no we don't want to do that type of stuff no if it is there but did you actually <laughs> and follow through with what they're, you're doing. And that's where you have to look and say, you've got to have a strategy as to how we're doing things.
So I am very cautious of time here and I want to turn to our last segment now. And this is my favorite segment because as someone who has been locked down going through treatments for cancer for the last two years, I am excited to get out on the road this year and actually visit the communities that are coming on the show. So yes, I will be in the city of Weyburn to visit some of these tourist spots. But for those who are listening across this country, Mayor, what tourist destination should people stop in and what hidden gems are in the city of Weyburn that they need to see when they're well first off I'm glad to hear that you're healing on your cancer treatment secondly is that the hidden gems I would suggest that you come uh, that week of Halloween uh, Halloween week to Weyburn because in the far south part they've started years back they brought in it's called a heritage village they brought in uh, houses from around the area, small houses, small churches, all the stuff of the there is. And last year, the city allowed this group to have a haunted house tour within their haunted tour. And that one was, it was people, five, it ran five days, and people were lined up like for three hours waiting to get in. And it was a huge success, and they actually had to turn people away. And people were tapping out within the first two houses of going there. They're too scared to go any farther. It was a wonderful site. It was a wonderful, well done thing. So that was one of the huge things that are hidden gems. Where Our hidden gem, our Spark Center, very much, uh, which is our indoor soccer field. It has been the administration again and engineering and the builders did such a good job on that. It was, it's a very hidden gem that is to be seen. We have... Um, our, and within our museum is uh, we had one of the structures that was the largest structure in the uh, United Kingdom was uh, again North Battleport had one and, and so uh, ours too was uh, the uh, facility for those with uh, mental health issues and it was torn down but we saved some of the different remnants of the things a lot of advances were made there a lot of things were done that probably shouldn't have been done on there but a lot of advances. I know that shouldn't have been done. There are a lot of advances went over there, but they've got some artifacts there that are just incredible to see within our museum. They've saved that. So those are, are uh, terrific uh, spots that are there. And then within our, uh, our we've got a, a camping, Riverside Camping Park. People come and book that park <laughs> years in advance to be there in one place. I'm here every summer. <laughs> they just, they love this little park there. It's right by the river. It's very quaint and very nice. And people really enjoy uh, the area. So we've got uh, so many things. And then, plus, we have our, you know, as the usual, the agriculture fairs, our flavors of fall, where we've got uh, a wonderful uh, sampling of all the liquors and wines and foods from around the area. So these are, these are wonderful things that we uh, have within the area. Each area has got. You, you you answered my question, this next question already a little bit, but I'm going to press you a little bit on it. After a stressful okay. day, after a stressful day at council or at work, where do you go to decompress? And I'm going to preface this by saying you can't say your own house because every council I've spoken to wants to say their house because they want to get away from being the mayor or councillor for a moment. So where in the, ta- the city of Weyburn do you go? Is there a restaurant? Is there a park that you can just go and walk? Well, there's there's a there's a, uh, a uh, you've got gyms. Where do you go here. to get an old fashioned in the town? <laughs> old fashioned. You can go to the Pump Jacks is one of the ones the the local tavern that I hang, hang out there, and they make a wonderful chicken cordon bleu, a homemade chicken cordon bleu that's just so excellent over there. Uh, we have the Royal Hotel that has the best sushi around. I just saw the other day they had the worm sushi. It was is well done. What a decorative uh, one. And it's just a wonderful, uh, they do unbelievable sushi there at the Royal Hotel and great dinner specials. So those are the places where a person can go and decompress and uh, sit there and, and talk to the friends. And then you've got just all the surrounding communities and you, know, you can go down to Estevan and uh, hang out there. And you'd have to stay overnight because again, <laughs> you can't drink and drive from that home. But there's, there's the ones around and there's uh, just great uh, uh, places, small towns around that you can go and uh, have great times. And even getting up into Regina, uh, they have great events up there. If you want to see concerts, they've got the, you know, the concerts in the park by the uh, concert by the river, I believe. So, but that's Saskatoon again. I mean, that's how, a, 
Yeah. How far is Regina to uh, Weyburn? It's only an hour. It's oh. only an hour. So, so when you're like in Calgary, I mean, you're driving across the city anyway. This is an hour clear drive. It's not that far. And people go, wow, it's an hour. No, it's not. It's not that far. And it's just, it's very close. Very close. They can listen to this interview in that hour time. So there you go. Oh, <laughs> Um, so my very last question for you, uh, Mayor Roy, is this, and take as long as you want to answer this question, but it's the, the most important question about your city. What makes the city of Weyburn such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think it's the spirit of the city itself. Uh, people will come together numerous times. There have been different things where people have fallen on um, uh, either by fires or by uh, uh, different devastating things. People have come together. It's a very spirit uh, related. When we have events, we had uh, like our soccer tournament, uh, junior soccer tournament in here. There was 300 to 50 to 400 kids that came in. People were all out for that. The baseball, the sports, we've got a huge, huge sporting. And sports are good for activities, but it's also, it draws the community together. And everything. We have, like I said, the flavors of fall. I think the one, uh, the other, time they had almost 800 people come out for this which is a huge amount for coming out to this small uh a smaller city which we are a city 11,000 population a town by ontario standards but we're we got to have 800 people come out to these events and they're all well attended and we get huge attendance uh out. so there's a huge community spirit within us and that's what that's what makes waver very unique uh they're Everybody's and everybody kind of knows everybody. We don't have these. There's we don't have a lot of these inter problems between groups or whatever. It's everybody is 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 just simply everybody's just everybody. They're all working together. They're outside. They're working. It's an like I say. It's a very blue collar town as such, and so there's lots of outdoor work, and everybody knows everybody. Mayor Roy, it's a very, I, wanna... I was Go going ahead. to say. Is that it's kind, of, it's kind of like even like Calgary isn't that big because you know you start talking especially in the oil field the the, the people start talking about oh yeah I know that is out there they start naming out names everybody knows the oil patch is really very small and it extends into Calgary and everybody knows everybody and the names start getting around and it becomes very and that's the whole point about this we can go through our whole communities, all the way out to Carlisle, Red Verse, Estevan, you know, all around, go out to the west. People know everybody within this, this area. So it's not just wavering itself. It's a very extended community. Mayor Roy, I want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to talk about your community and talk about yourself. As I said, I'm looking forward to being in the city of Weyburn, maybe in October for that haunted house, because I'm always up for a good scare. So I, I might have my October already planned now. So I want to thank you. And uh, I, I say this with all respect. The city of Weyburn is lucky to have you at the head of the council table and lucky to have you around that council table. I can I can sense that there is a moment as my dogs start barking at this closing um, that you are in it for the right reasons and we need more people like you. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're welcome. Thank you for being there. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.